why waste a brilliant paint job by painting over a wall that has a really uneven pitted finish? What I'm going to show you how to do today is fix little dings and dents and bruises in walls and really big cracks too, um, so that when you do do the painting, suddenly what you have is a glorious glowing room and not just a room of a different color. Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about walls before we get started. This happens to be a plaster wall. Now if your home is more than 40 years old, you probably have a plaster wall too, but you might have drywall. Drywall is a more modern wall surface. This is how to tell what you have, because the treatments for fixing um, cracks are quite different. Take a push pin and push it into the wall. This is drywall, so the push pin goes in really easily. If you have a plaster wall, the pin doesn't want to go in at all. I literally just cannot push it in. So this is definitely plaster. Now, here's some of the tools that we're going to be using today. This is a giant drywall knife, a fine thing to own. This is a drywall tray, cheap, efficient. Also, we have an uh, assortment of putty knives and drywall taping knives, some scissors, the odd sponge, and some other little bits that we'll get to. So, this is what we do when we're trying to fix a crack in a plaster wall. The best part, the first thing you get to do is make it really, really big. So I'm going to take my utility knife and I'm going to score the paint around the crack and really get all the loose stuff out. Isn't that great? This is the beauty of having a good drop cloth. So see what's happening here? There's a lot of, there's plaster, which is white, over a coating of cement-like brownie stuff. And I'm going to make this crack really big so that there's no chance of it recurring on us. It's really, it's really like sand that comes out. Okay. And I'm just going to take it back a little bit further because the wall is still, it's kind of punky and soft here. Now the paint here, this has had about seven coats of paint on it. So I'm going to carve off the loose floppy paint too. I'm getting down to the bottom of the crack now. Look at that, just keeps coming. I'm gonna just dig this out a little bit further because um, there seems to be no end to the amount of sand that's willing to come out of that hole. Probably pretty soon the whole wall is gonna start to hollow out because there's so much sand coming out of here. Well, there's a nightmare for you. Paint this. <laughs> if the window starts to fall out, somebody tell me. <laughs> Look at it, it just it just keeps coming really. <laughs> well, this is the kind of thing you run into. Well, it's just let's just sit here and watch it. Here we go. <laughs> uh, is this like candid camera or something? <laughs> somebody rigged this. <laughs> okay, I can actually, with my thumb, push this whole, oh geez, it's rotten, look at that. Okay, well, our small but tasteful plaster crack has now turned into a giant crevasse, as they say in mountain climbing circles. So, we're just going to make the best of it, which sometimes means making a really big mess. Okay, now I'm starting to get to the point, I think there must have been some moisture damage here before because the um, surface of the plaster is kind of hacked up here. But I'm getting to the point where the paint is tight against the wall, which is a really good sign. It means that we're getting to the end of this monstrous crevice. It's so nice to destroy things 
and then fix them again. There we go. That was our problem. Okay, this is good. This is a kind of peculiar wall because I don't know if you can see this, but underneath the la or the plaster there is actually some kind of wall board. So, and then underneath that, all I can see is um, two by four um, studs. This hole is so deep and so much deeper than we have expected that I'm going to put a little bit of the drywall compound into it so that it's not so spongy. Now that I've got dust in everything, I'm just going to clear, clean out my little tray. What I think this wall is made of is um, it's plaster over wall board, which isn't really lath and plaster, which most people would probably find. But in the 50s, they did a lot of um, sort of little piecework um, patches of wall board and then plastered over that. So I think that's what we're dealing with here. Where the sand came from, I have no idea, and I'm trying not to think about it. So here's my tray, and I'm going to take my three and a half inch knife and I'm going to load some compound into my tray. This is all purpose joint compound. There's a bunch of different kinds. All purpose is the best one for this application. Whoops, there it goes all over me leg. Oh, and just before I do this, I'm going to, um, I'm going to wet the crack because it's still a bit dusty. So I'm going to dip my paintbrush in some water over here and just Moisten the crack. Okay. Now, I'm really going to try not to get the compound on the wall because I still have to apply the self-adhesive tape to the wall. And I don't want gobs of this stuff interfering with that procedure. This is a bit like feeding a toddler, except there's less aiming. There you go. Sweet talking your wall is always a good way to practice those qualities of patience and beneficence that go with parenthood, really. If I'd thought ahead at all, I'd be wearing my latex gloves. And then I could poke, poke the stuff up into that little crevice up there. But I'm just going to use a smaller knife. So what I'm attempting to do is bring the surface of the compound flush with the surface of the wall. And this is so thick, it's going to take a couple of days to cure. But I'll still put my tape on now. OK, so I've basically built out the deep, dark crevice so that I can apply this tape, assuming I can find the end of it somewhere. There it is. If you choose a really hot day for this, you'll, you'll be even more satisfied with the results because you know you really suffered. So the um, all-purpose drywall compound will shrink a little bit as it dries, but it'll be better than that spongy affair that I had the first time. It's really an irritation to have integrity in your home repair, but you know what? You'll be happier with the result. This is just turning out to be so much messier than I had anticipated it, but it's more often than not the case. Oops. Okay, 
there we go. I'm just going to put a bit more. So what we're doing now is just making sure that, that we're as messy as possible so that we can feel like we really accomplished something. All right, then. You know what? This stuff, this stuff is like sucking the moisture right out of my bloodstream, so I'm just going to go get some latex gloves, and I'll be right back. You always have to make that little snapping sound. Makes you feel really official. Okay, now I've got my tray and I'm gonna put a bit more compound in it. You know, you, ca you can use this drywall compound right out of the bucket, but it's not as um, precise because you're having to scrape your blade off on a curved surface and you just can't get that nice kind of masonry ring to the whole thing. So here I go. Now, the, the object of the game is to get as little of this compound on here the first time as possible. So you're not trying to fix it in one pass. This, this is like a four section, a four stage repair. You'll be so happy to know. So I just barely am gonna cover the tape. And I'm mostly going right now for just, just to get it to adhere. So you start um, with a thick dollop in the center and then feather it out to the edge. Now, you can see it's just bulging a little, so I'm going to take my knife and apply steady pressure along the crack and try to move some of that excess down to this end where we didn't have it as full. The joint compound does shrink as it cures, so I'm not anticipating that to be a problem in the long run. Okay, so now I'm going to take a slightly wider knife or in this case, way wider. I'm going up to the 10 inch blade now, which is dusty from my previous attempts at cleaning out the crack. And with the big wide knife, I'm just gonna take um, from, the, from the center of the crack out, just feather the drywall compound as much as I can. And tear up all the tape in the same moment. <laughs> Boy, that's satisfying. So let me just smooth that down again. That's one thing to be careful of. The tape, um, as you work over and over the crack, the tape can act up on you and start to fray at the edges. We'll cover this up in, in, um, in the process of repairing the wall, though. OK, now it's tempting to keep working it but as you can see, I'm already starting to tear up the tape. So the thing to do now is walk away. You're going to need to come back to it and start to fill it out again. And you just, every time you come back to it, you just keep feathering it farther out. So the, the final surface area of this little skinny crack that we're fixing, the surface area of the entire repair is going to be about this size on the wall because that's what it's going to take to get the subtle feathering quality of the drywall compound so that it doesn't look like, well, there's a repair, which is just not something you want people to sort of come over for dinner and then stop and look at the wall and think, <laughs> by geez, there's an amateur in this home. When you go to paint a room, you also have to, of course, remove any artwork or mirrors that are hanging on the wall. And depending on... Um, the circumstances, you might find a, a tortured array of art hanging devices hiding behind the stuff that you take off the walls. Now, just to show you um, what you might find, we, we have here, this is the nail, which is used as a picture hanger. hanger. This is um, a screw that somebody's driven into the wall. And this is a, a very sophisticated attempt. This is a screw driven into an anchor. And all of these things should come out of the wall so that you can fill the little holes in case you don't decide to hang artwork here in this very spot again. At least the wall is smooth. So we'll start with um, 
Look at that ugly looking nail. So here the, here's a couple of things. You don't want to wreck the wall even more than it's already wrecked. So, so you don't, um, what I'm going to be doing here is using a hammer to pull this nail out in the direction in which it was um, nailed into the wall. It's on a bit of an angle. So you can use a shim like this, a little piece of wood, or this pry bar, which is even strong, um, less likely to put a ding in the wall. So I'm going to hook the hammer. And now, see, I'm pushing um, against the pry bar. There we go. So that's left a smart little hole in the wall, which we'll patch. And then we have a screw to remove. That wasn't too bad. And then See, that was cool. There. Now I have four smart little holes which I need to patch. And just I'm just going to clean them up a little bit before I start to patch them. Because this is um, this wall has had a lot of layers of paint. And I just want a nice clean finish without all these little poke up rims of paint around the holes. Okay, and now I'm just going to dampen those holes with um, a damp paintbrush so that they're ready to accept the filler I'm going to put in them. Now, you're about to fill these little holes with wall patch compound. There are a couple of different kinds. Uh, these holes are a quarter of an inch or less in diameter, so we can use the quick stuff. It's very lightweight, it cures really quickly, and you can usually paint over it the same day. If your holes turned out to be giant gouges, then you have to go with more of the polyfill variety, which is, um, it, it'll fill a bigger hole. It does shrink a bit, though, so you'll need at least two coats of this stuff. So we're going to go with this. And I'm going to just use a really nice, flexible knife so that I can push the compound into these holes. I'm going to put on my latex gloves, too, because this stuff smells a bit foul. You know when they say low odor on the container that you're in trouble, because that's a flag right there that's going to smell bad. All right, so <laughs> here we go. OK, so don't get too much on your knife to start with. And the technique is to sort of press it in like this and then whip it away and scoop it out. Again, press and then scoop away the excess. There we go. That looks pretty good. All right, now this is the deal. Painting itself doesn't take very long, but the preparation for painting can be obnoxious. You have to fill the holes. There's stuff coming off of my glove. I just have to stop because <laughs> every time I put my hand out, all this powder's coming out of my gloves. You see, I'm being economical. I put talcum powder in my latex gloves so that I can reuse them. But it's heartbreaking as I raise my hand and all this powder comes out. So I, oh, oh, my heart is racing with mirth. All right, so as I was saying, when you've patched the holes, you can sit back, you can feel good, but your job isn't quite over yet. Because what you have to do is when that stuff is dry, which won't take very long, is that you need to come back and you need to sand it lightly, like so. I'm just showing you the sanding action and the talc falling out of my gloves. Um, and then what you need to do after that is prime it. If you don't prime those little patched areas, they're going to suck the paint of your beautiful fresh coat of paint at a much different rate than the hard surface that's already painted around it. So you'll be so sorry. So do prime, do prime your little holes. And here's one more tip. If you're not the kind of person who wants to clean all the brushes out every darn time you paint, 
what you do is you wrap the bristles in foil and put them in the freezer and you can leave the brushes there because the, the freezing retards the curing process of the paint. So when you pull the brush out, just let it thaw and you're ready to go again. <clears throat> I'm going to go just put a little bit more talcum powder in my gloves. <laughs> there we go. And they make that good sound too. Oh yeah, that's fun. Caulking is a dirty, dirty business. Many is the day I've been up to my elbows in caulk, but I have devised a custom solution to prevent the kind of things that have happened to my clothes from happening to yours. This attractive little shop apron can be devised and designed by anyone with a little ingenuity and fashion sense. Notice the scalloping. I've attractively positioned at the neckline and also around the hemline. Protecting you from not only caulk, but all varieties of drippy messes, the shop apron can also be redesigned seasonally. For a repair to remember, I'm Meg Ruffman. <laughs>